Every year, a group of people starts their exciting career in software development with Instill. Um, we run an academy for those people, and this year I was asked to run a few um, different sessions um, for our new starts on a number of different topics. One of them um, was around AWS best practices, and obviously this is a huge topic that we could never really boil down into just a few slides. Um, so instead, I decided to focus on well, what would be some best practices that would be really good to know whenever you start your AWS career or you start your career in cloud development in general. And we're just going to cover a few of them now in, the, in this video. So I think the, this should be the obvious choice. This should be the obvious first choice um, when you're developing cloud applications. Security should be at the forefront of your mind. It's a never-ending game of cat and mouse. It's not a checkbox exercise that you can just add a ticket for, you know, for security and ever mark that as done. And as your application evolves, so must your security posture. Um, and, but here's a few points to consider from the outset of your career and things to think about when you're working with, with AWS. And one of them is that you need to really understand the shared responsibility model. Thankfully, when you are working with AWS or working with any kind of cloud provider, part of the security burden has been taken care of for you. This is explained with what AWS called the shared responsibility model. There's a few different diagrams for it, but here's one from the AWS documentation. And really in this, in this model, what it's trying to lie out is that the orange boxes are the things that you're essentially paying AWS for. Those are things that you don't really need to worry about and those are, they're taken care of for you. And it starts from something really basic like um, even just making sure that the physical infrastructure is kept secure and um, all the way up to you know, the different the services that you can use. As a customer of AWS then, there's, there's things that you need to consider that AWS aren't really going to take care of for you. They might provide certain guardrails and they provide certain um, ways of making these things easier. Um, but it's still your responsibility to think about those things and understand um, what the best practices are in those areas. They boil it down to this, AWS's responsibility is the security off the cloud, but it's your responsibility as an AWS customer for the security in the cloud. Um, you can minimize um, your responsibility by choosing more managed services, but there will always be some level of responsibility as a customer of AWS. Following on in this, this thread of security then, so this is more of a practical example. It might not necessarily be something that you ever have to do. Um, these, these are things that um, typically should be set up by your organization. Um, but I felt it was important to include because you might set up an AWS account in your own personal time to do some learning or to, to, to do some training. And even then, whenever it's, that's, you know, not your month, that's not your company's money you're spending, that's your own money. So it's really important that you secure that account from the offset. Um, whenever you create your account, you'll create something that's known as a root user. And it can then be tempting to just continue to use that user to um, deploy and manage your application. However, this root user has the keys to the kingdom. It is a, you consider it to be a super admin. And if, that, uh, if you created an access key for that account and it was compromised in any way, you have this potential to lose everything in the account. Um, somebody could rack up an enormous AWS bill on you. And if you were doing this for a company or something, then you could potentially expose further information about your organization. And while securing your account isn't a magic bullet that's going to keep your uh, cloud environment totally secure, you need to consider it as part of the Swiss cheese approach to security or the Swiss cheese model, where every layer of cheese in this diagram is just another way of protecting yourself from some kind of threat. Um, some threats might get through some of the holes, but hopefully another layer in that model will then block it from, from actually causing any damage to your account. When you're setting up your, your account then, here's some good rules to follow. Do not create any access keys under the root user. Do not share the root user credentials. Do use a strong password and password manager. And do enable multi-factor authentication. Um, I would also like to add that these steps should be followed for any subsequent account creations. And um, these can all be enforced as well at the account level. Continuing on, another um, sort of uh, principle to follow is this principle of least privilege. Um, it's, a, it's an important aspect to consider throughout the development, entire software development life cycle. And the idea here is that a principle, now this is where things get confusing because AWS refers to things with principle with an AL and there's principle with an LE. Um, and really a principle is a human user or workload that can make a request for an action or operation on an AWS resource. So we think about, if we take the example of a person, you know, a person should only be able to perform the specific actions and access the specific resources 
that is required for them to do their job. And even more importantly, whenever you uh, configure some kind of service, whether that be a Lambda function or something like that, that Lambda function should only be able to do what is necessary for it to actually function properly. Um, my advice here is to let your infrastructure as code framework do the hard work for you. Um, CDK provides these really nice set of grunt functions that um, really make this easy. So the example we can see here is that we have a Lambda function and all we want to do is grant it read access to, to an S3 bucket. We don't want it to be able to create any objects. It's just be able to read um, objects out of that. And whenever you leverage tools like CDK, it makes it really easy. This this one line of code, you know, creates you know uh, d uh, more than a dozen lines of cloud formation that you simply just don't have to write and worry about. And it sort of helps you know, to follow some best practices without necessarily understanding exactly what goes into to creating that IAM policy. It's still important to understand what IAM policies are and how they work because there's times. Um, even when using CDK, they have had to maybe debug those and, and there's been some things that haven't been quite right. Um, so it's not it's not a magic bullet by any means, but it's just a way to sort of give yourself some guardrails um, when you're starting um, uh, deploying your applications. I, my, I have a rule of thumb where if I find myself handwriting an IAM policy, it's probably time to stop and think, is there a better way where I can achieve this using CDK or something like that? Again, under the, under the topic of security, then handling secrets. It's highly unlikely that you'll have an application that's totally self-contained. It's always going to have to reach out to something to, you know, to get some information or perform an API call or connect to a database. And to quote Corey Quinn, he says, let's further assume that you're not a dangerous lunatic who hard codes those secrets into your application code. You never want to hard code any kind of secrets. You don't want to push any secrets into Git. Um, you want those to be an external service where they are encrypted and stored in the in this most secure way as possible. AWS gives us two sensible options, the Systems Manager Parameter Store and the AWS Secrets Manager. And it can be tempting to just use Secrets Manager because it's a really well-named service for managing secrets. Um, but there's, a, there's an additional cost to using that service whenever, uh, and sometimes using a parameter store with a secure string parameter type might actually save you some money and just be a simpler option in general. And I'll include a link to a blog post that lays out um, all of these points with some subsequent links to to better resources that explain these in more detail. Um, so again, some do's and do nots. Do not store secrets in plain text on developer machines. Do not include secrets in log messages. Um, do not reuse secrets across environments. But do use infrastructure as code to help um, with these things and do rotate your secrets. Um, rotating secrets is something that is taken care of by services like the Secrets Manager. Um, and including that functionality from the beginning is much easier than trying to do it retrospectively. When handling sensitive data in the cloud, it's important to protect it. And another layer in your um, your Swiss cheese model is encryption, uh, both while the data is in transit and at rest. And it can be surprising at times to, to find out that certain services in AWS don't always encrypt things by default. That's something that you need to go and turn on and actually configure. And thankfully, um, using tools like CDK NAG can help you to enforce some best practices around this and enable encryption from the beginning. Um, CDK NAG is great. It'll, um, whenever you synthesize your, your application, it'll tell you, you know, you've forgotten to turn on encryption for this S3 bucket or for this DynamoDB table um, or something like that. And it's really just a nice way of keeping you right. But it's still important to know that um, these tools aren't, aren't foolproof. You need to understand the importance of encryption and how to actually configure that. Um, for whatever service you're trying to use. And um, so taking a step back from security, and there's obviously a lot more we can cover in security, but those are just some, some places to get started. Um, moving on to cost then, it's becoming increasingly apparent that cloud developers need to understand the cost of the changes that they're making. And, and really, if you deploy an application and it costs too much to run, um, really at that stage it's almost too late. The idea of cost should have been thought about and factored into the design phase, design stage of the development process as well. And really, when you're thinking about cost, you want to consider the total cost of ownership. You know, it's it's easy to look at the the pricing table in AWS and sort of go, well, this is this is this this service is way too expensive for what we wanted to do. But when we think about the total cost of ownership, there's there's a lot of different things you need to think about. There's the infrastructure. You know, how much uh, compute and provisions components and storage you're going to use. How much does the initial development cost? You know, engineers are expensive. Um, you know, how much money would be saved by just using an off-the-shelf service and maintenance as well? What's the ongoing maintenance going to be like for you know for your servers for patching them and, and implementing bug fixes? So it's not just as simple as the pricing tables in AWS, but I would say that 
Understanding the pricing structure of all the different services is really important. It's something that you need to practice to really get right. And it's something that you should definitely consider um, during the designs um, phase of whatever you're trying to build. And th this ties nicely into the next point we've had, you know, um, uh, security and cost. And then moving on then from cost is serverless first. You know, serverless means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and, you know, the joke is, well, there's always servers. And yes, there are always servers involved, but really those servers aren't your responsibility. You know, this, this notion of serverless is really that it's a way of building and running applications without having to manage the underlying infrastructure on AWS. And like I said, of course, there's servers running somewhere, but they're just not your responsibility. And that can help reduce that total cost of ownership that we've, that we've um, talked about. And instead, developers can focus on building, you know, um, the best product for their customers rather than having to worry about a whole load of infrastructure stuff. AWS calls that stuff undifferentiated heavy lifting. Those are things that don't really make your, your product any, in any way unique. They're just things that you have to do to be able to um, have an application that runs or runs um, online. And you know, the benefits of serverless are clear. There's no infrastructure provisioning or maintenance. It automatically scales. You pay for what you use and it's highly available and secure. And those are all really good things, but we don't want to be dogmatic we don't want to have a group of serverless only engineers, however tempting that may be for myself. Um, under certain circumstances, that can lead to increased complexity for no reason and increased cost, especially at a certain scale. You know, serverless first really means to treat serverless as the first step. Use it to make a start, use it to iterate quickly, and use it to get rid of some of that undifferentiated heavy lifting. But don't be sad if it's not a good fit for a certain customer or a certain workload. And when we're designing our architectures, we need to treat things as two-way doors. We don't want to be backed into some kind of decision that we can't get out of. Um, so if something doesn't work or something starts to cost too much money, change it as simple as that. Don't feel like you're stuck um, with this thing. There's always ways that you can slowly migrate to another service and slowly improve things over time. Another best practice, I feel, is to master the basics. You know, serverless, it's entirely possible that your, your first project um, is using all serverless services and that's got rid of a lot of undifferentiated, undifferentiated heavy lifting that we, like, like we've talked about. Um, but that doesn't mean that you should be ignorant to those things. Things like networking concepts and core AWS services should really be understood, even if they're not part of the serverless offering. You know, if we're taking this serverless first approach, there might be times when you can't necessarily use a Lambda function and you have to understand what you need to do to use something like, a, like a, an ECS um, service or an EC2 server or something like that. And there's some great ways in which you can get exposed to these things if they're not necessarily part of your day job. And um, probably the biggest one is AWS certifications. It's a huge undertaking to, to do those, but the, the training uh, material out there is absolutely brilliant. And we'll cover things like EC2 and all those things that you might not necessarily have to work on day to day. I would also highly recommend the Tech Fundamentals course by Adrian Cantrell. And um, it covers a lot of things that you might've covered in university and have maybe not quite understood or maybe forgotten about. Um, you know, things like the OSI 7 layer model, um, uh, firewalls, DNS, uh, border gateway protocol, all these things that you might not necessarily need to know day to day, but there's certain times where there might be an outage that you have to explain to a customer, and it might be down to one of these services. For example, border gateway protocol um, took down Facebook in 2021 and and um, and things like that. So uh, you might have to explain these, these uh, concepts to a customer without not necessarily being able to actually implement something like that. Another best practice is to automate everything. Um, we've talked about infrastructure as code frameworks already, things like CDK. They ensure that you have consistent consistency and, and repeatability in creating the resources on, on, in your cloud. And But while we might not be dealing with physical servers, I find this, this uh, concept of a snowflake server a really nice way of, of reminding ourselves why we, why we automate our deployments. So um, snowflakes are good for ski resorts, but really bad for servers. And the reason being is that snowflakes are unique. You know, each individual snowflake is unique, but we don't want our servers to be unique. We want them to be something that we can tear down and recreate uh, in just a few minutes. Another way of, of looking at it is you don't want your servers to be works of art, you know, unique to that specific artist. You want it to be more like a mass produced thing than each individual, um, each individual deployment is exactly the same as it was before. And asking a human to perform those tasks it's always going to result in some small change that could lead to some uh, big ramifications um, in the future or, or straight away. Um, we love using CDK and still, and one of the nice benefits of that is that it has 
loads of ready-made constructs and patterns for you to reuse on your projects as well. And then as we come to a close then, um, yes, we've covered some you know, high-level best practices when you're starting your AWS career, but AWS, of course, have their own best practice guide. I call the well Architected Framework the mother of all AWS best practice guides. It really takes some of the things we've talked about um, already and expands on them in, in far greater detail than we could ever cover, and like I said, in just a few slides. And it breaks it down into six pillars. Operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, cost optimization, and sustainability. And each of those pillars has a huge amount of resources on um, what it takes to be, what it takes for operational excellence, what it takes for security, things like that. So while this might be hugely intimidating for somebody who's starting their career, hugely intimidating for somebody who is, you know, working in production right now, um, it's important to understand these six pillars, understand what each of them contains, and improve your architecture over time. Um, you're not going to be able to just be well architected straight away. And what you want to do is to have to make small steps to improving your architecture over time and really iterate on these six things so that you can uh, measure an improvement over time. And that's really all. So hopefully um, you find uh, find this um, video beneficial, even if you are um, you know used to working with AWS or you're brand new. Uh, hopefully these are some best practices that you can take away and start using in your in your day job right away.